Well, for the first 23 years of my life, I was more interested at Christmas time in receiving gifts than I was giving gifts. I'm just being honest with you. That's kind of how it works, right? Growing up, the joy of Christmas is about what you're going to get. And as a young person, that was kind of my focus, even into my early 20s. I mean, I enjoyed giving gifts to people. That was something that, that I did enjoy doing. But if I was to be honest and to be real, I was more looking forward to receiving than I was giving. But all that changed about 15 years ago for me. Uh, I had gotten back from college, and I met this girl. And right away, we started hanging out. This is the fall of 2007. And by the time December rolled around, I knew that this was the girl I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. Um, I had fallen in love with her, and uh, I, I just knew that this was the one. Now, I can't quite remember her name at the moment, but uh, I'm just kidding. This is my wife. I'm just joking. It's not a story. That would be awkward, wasn't it, if I told a story like that about my... Anyways, it's my wife. And that Christmas, right? I remember that first December, the first Christmas that we were together, I knew that she was the one for me. And I was so excited to, to, to give, to buy gifts. It was like, you know, the Grinch, right? My heart grew three times bigger. I just all of a sudden felt this desire just to be generous, to give. I was, I was looking forward to that more. And there's a reason for that. Why? Well, love is what propels generosity, that's what prompted the change. And even now for us parents, right? I mean, Christmas is an exciting time and it's time for family and getting together. But for me as a parent, I'm way more excited about giving to my kids and enjoying the holiday with them and having them just be so excited on Christmas morning. That gives me more joy than receiving. And again, that's because love fuels generosity. And I believe this morning, we are gonna see that this is also true when it comes to the nature of, of God. We have a God who is abundant in his love, and because of his love, he is so generous to us. In fact, generosity is the evidence of God's love, and we're going to see that uh, in the text of Scripture this morning. So I'm going to invite you to see this with me. It's in Romans chapter 8. So go ahead and open your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8 this morning. If you came here and you didn't bring a Bible, the Bible in front of you, you're welcome to use. If you don't own a physical Bible, take that Bible home with you. We'd love for you to have a Bible today. And if you don't know where the book of Romans is, I'll give you a helpful hint. Go three quarters of the way into your Bible. You get to the New Testament. You have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then Romans. If you hit 1st or 2nd Corinthians, go backward. Romans 8 is where we're at. And uh, as you're turning there, I just want you to know that we're kicking off a mini-series here during December. It's called The Greatest Gift. And this is going to be a series where we're taking time, uh, specifically next Sunday, to give you an opportunity this Christmas season to give back. And while we're on the subject of talking about generosity in Christmas, I want to take a moment just to make a public statement for a second. If I can do that, use this time here to make a public statement. Some of you were with me uh, about a month or so ago when I preached a message, and in the beginning of the message, I talked about waiting in line at Bronner's. So I don't know how many of you were here and remember this. I show up on a Saturday. The line was super long to get an, uh, an ornament personalized. It was Saturday at noon, the worst time to go, right during their busy season. Waited for over an hour and got, a, got an ornament. Now, I talked about the experience of waiting and how that was a challenge, but apparently the people at Bronner's heard about this and uh, the Bronner family uh, paid a visit to the church and dropped off a bag full of cookies to me outside my door, I know, with a, a really nice card from the Bronner family that said, hey, sorry, I had to wait. Hope you enjoy your Christmas. And so I'm just so thankful. This is, uh, they're very generous of them. And I want to just remind you, if you're ever in line at Bronner's, it's worth the wait. They're great people, and it's a wonderful organization. And I hope I reflected that when I talked, but it was just really kind of them. So cool that they dropped off those cookies, isn't it? So great. Also, while I'm on the subject, I just want to talk about how much I love Schaefer and Beer Line also. Um, <laughs> what a wonderful, wonderful group of people. If you have any automotive needs here, I encourage you to buy your cars and trucks at Schaefer and Beer Line. And if any of our friends at Schaefer and Beerline are listening today, let me just say you can drop off any gift in the parking lot throughout the week. <laughs> Leave the keys in my mailbox. Wow, this is terrible. This is turning, this is turning really bad this morning. Ugh. Okay. Well, I mentioned that it is Christmas season. We're talking about generosity. And we're going to talk at the end of the message about a great way for us to give back this Christmas season. And to set it up, I want to talk a little bit about an organization that we have partnered with over the last year that's near and dear to my heart. It's called Love for a Child. In fact, there's a few people today that were asking me, where's my flannel, right? All these people up here were in flannel today. You notice that? And I'm repping the Love for a Child shirt today. 
Uh, so I also happen to pick salmon color, and I realize I'm kind of pasty white, so now I just look like a salmon, I think, but <laughs> it's all right. But I'm repping Love for a Child today. That's why I'm wearing this. Love for a Child is an incredible organization. It's a nonprofit organization that's faith-based, that serves to really uh, help out those who are in the foster care system throughout the state of Michigan, who've experienced, in particular, extreme trauma, and abuse and neglect and abandonment. And not only do they offer summer camps and this wonderful experience in the summer for kids, but what they do is they really raise up leaders who partner with these kids, build relationships, and then they follow the kids around as they bounce from home to home. There's a constant source of Christian witness and friendship that supports these kids, and they offer the foster families other resources, uh, mentorship, things like that. And so what Love for a Child does is they love those who are the most neglected in the state and they shine forth the light of the gospel into one of the darkest corners of the state of Michigan. And so this past week, I had an opportunity to sit down with the founder and director of Love for a Child, Joseph Alley, and so we had a, a little conversation. So let's go ahead and take a look at this clip to hear about what we talked about. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm here with my good friend, Joe Savalli, and we're here to talk a little bit more about Love for a Child. So as many of you know, um, this past year we announced an uh, unofficial partnership with Love for a Child. And so Joe, I wanna just take some time and have you share a little bit about what this partnership looks like. Love for a Child is a Michigan nonprofit charity, as you know, but more than that, we are a faith-focused ministry that have planted a third office right here at Frankenmuth Bible Church in your community to impact children and youth who are suffering from abuse, abandonment, and neglect and are living in Michigan's foster care system. Over the last 15 years, we have been doing this in other regions of the state, but through different resources and research, uh, we've identified a large group of children and families who are at need in the local community and surrounding cities. And the Lord has led us to such a time as this to plant a third office right here in this community in partnership with this very church to serve the least of these. That's awesome. And you guys are providing camps and what other resources for kids are you providing? Yeah, through summer camps and direct mentorship services where a trained mentor is spending time with a foster child every single month, developing moments and creating memories for these kids. And we also provide resources, you know, food benevolence and uh, different things to help families who have been severely overlooked by our state. Love for a Child has stepped in at that time. That's awesome. Uh Talk a little more for a moment, Joe, just about some of the kids that you guys are serving. And as we make this partnership with you, uh, what, what kinds of people are we impacting through this ministry of yours? As much as we don't like to think it or talk about it, uh, the children in foster care that we serve are ages six to 12. And they fall under two different categories. Kids that have lived in 10 homes prior to the age of 10, and another group of children that have had five or more abuse partners sexually physically prior to the age of 10 and because of these two categories that collide oftentimes these children are about 92 percent likely to never be adopted simply because they've been placed in some type of profile that families don't want them and so love for a child said we're going to create a program in all areas of the state including frankenmuth to identify them serve them impact their lives with an intentional focus that hopefully changed their hearts forever through this amazing little thing that we call the love of Jesus. Joe, I appreciate you joining me today and sharing a little more with our church about what we're doing. We're gonna hear more from Joe and more about what they're doing uh, throughout this Christmas series that we're doing here. But thanks again, Joe, for joining us right now. Appreciate it. Bye. So as I mentioned, we're going to hear more about love for a child. And at the end of the message, I'm going to talk about specifically how we can play a role in impacting the lives of these children during this Christmas series and in particular next week. But uh, before I talk about the how, I want to take time to talk about the why today. And that's where we find ourselves in God's word in Romans chapter eight. And so if you're in Romans eight, we're going to jump in. I want to do something, though, that I often do on Sundays, and I want to give some context it's always helpful when we open our Bibles, especially if we're in the middle of a book. This is a letter that was written. We're jumping in the middle of a letter to know what's going on, what's the backstory behind this letter, why was it written, what's happening. And so I just want to take a little time to give you some context. So this is a letter 
the book of Romans, written by a guy named Paul. He was the Apostle Paul, right? He was the guy who traveled around as a missionary and he planted churches throughout the ancient world. He wrote this letter to a group of Christians who were gathering in the city of Rome and they were a a church that was established there. He wrote them a letter for a very specific reason, a very important purpose. Now, the church in Rome was probably founded after Acts chapter 2. So just to rewind your your brain for a second. If you remember when the early church started in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came and he indwelt the followers of Jesus for the very first time. And on that first day that the church was born, Peter stood up and he preached at Pentecost this amazing gospel message. And all these people, these Jews who had gathered from all over the region, came together to celebrate at, at Pentecost, the Jewish holiday. And as they were there, they heard Peter preaching in their own language. And likely, there were some Jews Jews from Rome who had gathered in the city that day, they heard the gospel, and then after believing in Jesus Christ, they came back to the city of Rome, and they established a church. And so, from the very beginning, from its inception in Rome, the church there had a very distinct Jewish flavor to it. Right, So basically, this church in in Rome was filled with Jewish believers, and the things they would do, the activities that they were engaged in, it all reflected Jewish culture and practices and heritage. So for example, when they would eat food, this church, this Jewish church in Rome, they would eat kosher, right? Or they would participate in certain Jewish ceremonial practices or festivals or holidays. So for, for years and years, at the very beginning, the church in Rome was Jewish. That's just the, the type of church it was. However, in the Roman Empire, there were various different emperors who took over. Uh, we know some of this throughout the course of church history, that in those first couple centuries, a lot of the emperors were, were pretty hostile toward the church. Well, one of the emperors that came to power was an emperor named Claudius. And he had made this edict that all the Jews who had lived in Rome were, were banished from the city. And so what happened is all these Jewish Christians who were gathering together in the church in Rome, they were forced to leave the city of Rome for five years. And so what that meant was the people who remained behind, these Christians were all Gentiles. They weren't Jewish. They were Gentile Christians. They were the minority who were in the church. Well, now they became the only members of the church. So slowly over the course of five years, as that church grew, it it became a Gentile kind of feeling and acting church, right? The flavor was a Gentile church at this point. So for example, when the church had a cookout, right? They're putting pork chops on the grill, which the Jews couldn't eat pork, right? So at the men's breakfast, right? The guys didn't just serve pancakes. It was pancakes and bacon. This is what the Jews were doing. So... After five years pass, eventually the edict is now done and the Jews can return back to the city of Rome. But this time when they came back, their church, their beloved church that did all the Jewish things that they loved was different. You know, people walked into the church basement and they could smell bacon. They knew that someone had served bacon in the church basement, right? So they knew that things were different. And so what happens in the church is when there are different people with different convictions and different ideas that collide, what do we often get? We get conflict, we get division, we get strife, we get drama. We can't relate to that drama, can we? No, we're not dramatic people, no. That's what happens with difference of opinions, right? When two, when two different people come together, we often see drama even today. And this is what was happening in the church of Rome. And so because of their disunity and because of all the drama, Paul was concerned that this church was missing the whole concept of the gospel. In fact, Paul was concerned that all their disunity would mean that they wouldn't be able to continue to help and and, and reach out to more people with the good news of Jesus. And so what Paul did was he wrote this letter to the Romans to set the record straight. Listen, Jesus is not just for Jewish people. Jesus is not just for Gentiles, right? The the gospel is a a message to all people. The Jesus movement is a multi-ethnic movement of people from various different backgrounds and cultures and languages, all tribes, tongues, and nations that are forming together as one family of Christ followers. That's what the church is. That's who the gospel is for. It's all about a, a unified family who are all people who are submitting to Jesus Christ as one family. And so up to chapter eight, this is what Paul has taken great efforts to explain. And now we're gonna pick up in verse 31 and we're gonna notice that Paul's gonna say something here that's interesting. So notice he begins a a series of rhetorical questions. The first rhetorical question is this. He says, what then shall we say to these things? Well, when we read this verse, we have to ask ourselves what Paul is talking about. What are these things he's talking about? What shall we say to these things? What things? 
Well, I believe that Paul is talking about everything he's just laid out in Romans chapters 1 through 8. Uh, He's talked about the gospel at length in Romans chapter 1 through 8. So, for example, in the first couple chapters of Romans, Paul talks about the fact that, that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That it doesn't matter if you're a Jew and you have the law, you've fallen short of that law. Or if you're a non-Jew, if you're a Gentile and you didn't have the law of Moses, you still have violated God's standards and expectations and all men are without excuse. This is what he talks about in Romans chapter 1 through 3. We've all sinned and we all deserve judgment because of our sin. That's the first couple chapters. But then in Romans 4, 5, and 6, Paul moves into the good news. He says, you know, there's a righteousness that's been revealed Apart from the law, this is a righteousness by faith. Just as Abraham believed God's promises and God credited him with righteousness, now because of what Jesus has done through his death, burial, and resurrection, those of us who trust in Christ by faith, we are declared righteous in God's sight. That's the beauty of the gospel. That Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose from the dead. And through trusting in Jesus, through faith in Jesus, not not through any works. I know there are some people perhaps even here today, this, you're new to church. And maybe you're thinking, hey, I, I need to get back in church because I know my life has been a mess. And so I want to know what I need to do to reach up to God. You see, the essence of the gospel is you can't do anything to reach up to God. You can't do it. You can't work your way up to God. But the good news is while you can't reach up to God, God can reach down to you and he did it through sending his son Jesus and through faith in Jesus, through trusting in Jesus Christ, God takes your sin and he exchanges it for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And so now when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He now looks at you as righteous in Christ. That is the good news that we read about in Romans 4, 5, and 6. And now in Christ, we are a new creation. We have a new identity. We talked a little bit about this last week. And as Paul Paul moves into Romans chapter 7 and 8, he now says that our new identity is very significant. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. Because we still carry around this body of sin, right? This sinful nature is still part of who we are. We're not fully redeemed yet. But what it does mean is that we now have freedom from the power of sin. This is the good news in Romans 7 and 8. Our flesh now wars against our spirit. There's a battle inwardly, and we feel that sometimes. Where we, we, as Paul says in Romans 7, the things that we don't want to do, we do. And the things that we, we do, we don't want to do. There's this tension, this wrestling. This is part of the Christian experience. But he says, thanks be to God, we have victory through Christ Jesus. Little by little, we're gaining victory over sin. That's called sanctification. We're growing more and more into the image of Christ. In fact, Paul says in Romans 8 that one day we're going to be perfected just like Jesus And so this is what he talks about. When he talks about these things, he's talking about all of that. Paul is talking about our salvation. He says, what should we say then in light of our salvation? What can you say? I mean, praise Jesus. That's what we could say. This is a rhetorical question for a reason, that God loves us so much. He has lavished upon us grace. He's given us so much mercy. This is not something we've earned. It's not anything we've done, right? If you have to earn it, it's a wage. It's freely given. It's a gift. Salvation is a gift that's given by God. And so the first thing we see as we look at this love of God, it's this. This is how we know God loves us. He gives us our salvation. God gives us our salvation. Out of the abundance of his great love for us, he gives us salvation. Now just think about that for a moment. What a generous God we have. Isn't that amazing? You know, we often talk about, you know, kids, if they don't behave, you're going to have a lump of coal, right? And all of us deserve the lumps of coal. We do. We don't deserve anything. But out of God's great love for us, nevertheless, he gives us salvation. And what God gives to us is of infinite value. This is why Jesus in Matthew chapter 13, he tells the story of the pearl of great, great price. When we find the kingdom, when we find salvation, it's worth infinite value. There's, there's nothing better than that. And so the first thing we see when we look at God's love and God's generosity is number one, God gives us our salvation. But as Paul continues, he asks another rhetorical question. Notice what he says next at the end of verse 31. He says, if God is for us, who can be against us? You see, sometimes life is hard, isn't it? And we make a false assumption when things aren't going the way that we feel like they should, that sometimes we think that the man upstairs might be angry with us. Don't we think that sometimes? 
And maybe we must have done something to make him angry, and that's why things are falling apart in life. And I realize that for some of you right during the holiday season, in particular, stuff is challenging. Things are difficult. And there might be moments where you're tempted to consider that maybe God is is, is not giving you certain things or the things you thought would happen because you've done something wrong and he's against you. I, I want you to know God is not against you. If you are in Christ, God is for you. God is for you. In Hebrews chapter 7, we are told that Jesus is our great high priest. What does a priest do? Well, in Israel, they would have a priest, a representative of the people, who would go on behalf of the people before God to offer sacrifice and to try to be the go-between, right? A mediator between God and man. And so the priest was a representative who, who went and pled the case of the people. Well, in Scripture, in, in Hebrews 7, Jesus is our great high priest. He is the one mediator be- between God and man. He is the, the God-man, the go-between, who, who goes before the Father and advocates for us and pleads for us. In fact, in, Romans, or in, in Hebrews 7.25, it says this, that Jesus always lives, hear this, always lives to make intercession for you. He always lives to make intercession for you. He is right now, presently, on high, in glory, next to the Father, presently pleading your case. Isn't that incredible? When you mess up, when you screw up, when you do something dumb, Jesus is not throwing up his hands and going, oh, there they go again. He's immediately getting to work. The moment you do something you shouldn't, he's immediately pleading your case before the Father because he always lives to make intercession for you. How incredible is it that we have a God who is for us, not against us? That no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, you have a God who's on your side, who's who's in your corner, always. That's who our God is. Which is why our second point this morning is this. Not only when we see the generosity of God, not only does he give us our salvation, but he also gives us his support. At all times, you have a God who's for you. And if God is for you, the rhetorical question is, who can be against you? If anybody is out to get you or opposed to you, but God is on your side, what do you got to worry about? The, the, the implied answer is, well, we shouldn't have to worry about anything. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nobody. We have nothing to worry about. If God is on your side, then nothing can be against you, right? No weapon formed against you shall stand. God is for you, so you don't need to live in fear. One of the things I'm reminded of with my own kids is there are times where I have certain rules that we, in, we have in the house And sometimes rules are not the most enjoyable thing when you give them to children, right? I could give plenty of examples of this, of rules that my kids don't like. But there are times when I'm trying to explain or enforce some sort of rule where I can see that they feel like I'm against them. And I often just remember this passage and and I'm prompted to say to them, hey, stop for a second. You know I'm for you, right? I'm not against you here. Like you might not understand what this rule is for, but I, I want the best for you. I want to see you successful. I want you to grow toward maturity and, and do the things that you're supposed to do. And this is for your good. This is for your protection. I'm for you, not against you. And that's the instinct sometimes is we forget that there is a God in heaven who is for us. He's for you. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing, he's for you. Jesus lives to make intercession for you. That's what he does. So we've seen here in Romans 8 these two rhetorical questions. The generosity of God is on full display in just these two questions. But as we prepare to wrap up, and this is a short message this morning, but as we prepare to wrap up, we're going to see one more example of God's love made manifest through his generosity. So notice what Paul says with this third rhetorical question. He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? You see, God's greatest expression of generosity is simultaneously the ultimate expression of love. If you're ever questioning whether or not God loves you, just stop and think about the cross. If you're ever wondering if there's a God in in heaven who truly loves you, just think about the cross. 
God loves you. We can see that, right? We know that because he's a generous God. What has he given us? He's given us our salvation. He's also given us his support, right? He's for us, not against us. But also the greatest expression of his love and generosity is seen in the fact that God gave us his son. He gave Jesus. He did not spare his son. He did not withhold his son. He freely gave us Jesus, his only begotten son, because God knew that salvation required sacrifice. And so God demonstrated his love toward us that while we were still sinners, he gave his only son, Jesus, to die. That's love. That's generosity. That's what love does. It it gives. I started this message by talking about something that really changed me 15 years ago. I fell in love with this girl. And my first Christmas with her, it was just like, I just wanted to give her whatever I could. I didn't care about what I got that Christmas. I wanted to give. Because that's what love does. It fuels generosity. And beloved, we see here at the end of the day that this is the heart of the Father. The big idea I just want to explain is very simple, but this this is it. Love gives. If you love someone, then you're generous. If you truly love them, That's your posture. That's your heart. Love gives. Isn't this what Paul is showing us in Romans 8? In fact, he goes on to say in verse 35, what shall separate us from the love of God? And he lists all these things. And again, the implied answer is nothing. No one can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's proven it through his generosity toward us, through our salvation, through his support, and through sending his only son. Beloved, love gives. And as Christians then, who've been given so much, the challenge we are faced with now is how do we respond to God's love? How do we respond to God's generosity? I began the message by talking about love for a child and talking about the kids who are served through that ministry and our partnership. And one of the reasons that this is such an amazing ministry that I love so much is because when I look at the kids that are being impacted through this ministry, Uh, I see so much need. These are kids who've experienced loss and brokenness. They've been abused. They've been abandoned. They've been mistreated. They've been neglected. And I think about that, and I think about a population of kids who've overwhelmingly received not generosity, but greed. Their innocence has been taken away. Their safety, it's been taken away. Their security, it's been taken away. Their childhood, it's been taken. Those kids haven't had many deposits. They've had a lot of withdrawals. And as I think about my own background, and I'll share more about this a little bit next week, but I've spent most of my life around kids who are in and out of the foster care system. And my career before here, I worked for five years in residential treatment, and I work with kids, and the population predominantly were were kids who bounced around the foster care system and finally were court-appointed to come to a treatment facility where they were given therapy and uh, trying to learn life skills. And so I had kids anywhere between 13 to 15 kids in our group that I was supervising and trying to get treatment for these kids. And I remember one individual in particular, this kid... um, always stands out to me most because he came my second year there and he was there beyond how long I stayed there. Uh, He came at around the age of 12 or 13. His name was Larry. Uh, Larry didn't really have a father figure in his life uh, because at five years old, his father who sexually and physically abused him and his siblings, um, the police were called. He actually threw uh, his infant child against a wall. And that's how the police found out. And then the rights were terminated from the father and mother. So Larry was separated from his siblings uh, for a little while. And then some of them were in the home. And then um, throughout his childhood, he was in a foster family. There was no father in the foster family, though. And the foster parent didn't know that uh, another older foster child for about six years straight was sexually and physically abusing Larry. That was the most stable foster home he ever had, by the way, because he was there for six years. So by the time Larry had gotten to us, he had had so much stripped away from him. He was struggling emotionally. Um, He had a hard time learning. He had uh, speech challenges. 
he was a kid who had developmental issues. He had anxiety and depression. They put him on a bunch of meds because he didn't know how to self-regulate. Uh, he was harming himself and others. And he also put himself into positions where he was frequently victimized. And Larry came into our program. And I was assigned to have Larry be the kid specifically. I was called his advocate. Same thing that Jesus is for us. I made sure that Larry's needs were met. I made sure I advocated for him. I made sure he had a voice when he needed things. And so for four plus years, I spent time with Larry. I spent time with him on Christmas mornings. And when Larry ended up aging out of our program, he was now an adult and almost immediately he had gotten into some trouble and he went to prison. And when he got out of prison, guess who the first person he called was? It was me, because I was the closest thing he had to a father figure. He didn't have a male in his life that helped explain basic things, life skills, stuff like that. And I look at kids like Larry, who's now in his 20s, and I haven't talked to him probably for a year. Last I talked to him, he was out, but he could be back in prison. I don't know. And I look at kids like that, and I go, man, what chance did they really have? If we as a church could try to pour into these kids early on while they're still in foster care. I got Larry when he was already a teenager. Early on, if we could start pouring into these children who were broken and needy and who were bouncing around from home to home, what an impact we could make in the lives of, of kids. We've been blessed with so much. We've been given so much. These kids have had so much taken. So what we're doing is next Sunday, I'm inviting Joe Savali to come. We're going to team teach. He's going to preach half the message. I'm going to preach half the message. And then at the end of the sermon, we're going to have an opportunity to respond with generosity. Now, our goal is to raise funds because we are launching the third camp, but we're also la launching their, their, their whole program here. Uh, they now have an office space at the Grove. It's been renovated. They've hired a, a full-time staff who will be jumping in, I believe it, sometime in the new year. To, to be working out of the Frankenmuth office here. Uh, they are preparing to get things together for a camp and they're gonna be getting volunteers and doing all that. But we wanna just begin their time by providing some seed money to get this off the ground because we wanna see love for a child reach more kids around here in this region. And so we're gonna have you have an opportunity to respond through generosity next week. So what I'm gonna do, my challenge for today is I wanna just have you think about and talk about with your family and pray about how you might be able to contribute toward this. I realize we're in a tough time economically in this country. Some people maybe have certain resources that others don't and that's okay. We're gonna be looking for volunteers down the road and we're gonna be looking for prayer partners as well. But if this is an opportunity for you to respond with generosity, I just want you to pray about that and consider that because again, at the end of next week, we're gonna take up an offering for love for a child. And we're doing it because we know that love gives. That's what it does. We've seen it from the heart of the Father. And my hope and prayer is that it's reflected through his people as we respond to the need that we have. So pray about it, think about it, talk about it. And make plans to join us next Sunday as we take up that offering. So thanks for joining us. I'm going to pray and then we're going to worship. Let's pray. Lord, thank you just for today. We thank you for your goodness to us. You're so generous and so loving that a sinner like me who doesn't deserve anything, I deserve the lump of coal, you gave me everything. My salvation, your support, your son. What shall we say to these things? Paul says in Romans 8.31, I don't know what else we can say except thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for all that you've lavished upon us. I pray that we, blessed people, rich in faith, would pour out some of the blessings that we've received upon those who've had so much taken. I pray that we would respond as a church um, just to this opportunity that we have before us. I pray for love for a child. I pray that you would use that organization to make an impact for your kingdom in this region, that they would bless the lives of kids who are so broken right now. 
So we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for this time. And now I pray as we respond that we would worship you and celebrate your son and the generous gift that he is and the hope of the resurrection that he provides. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.